Origin 6, Creation and the Fall. This uh, is part of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter of uh, 2013. The principal contributor is uh, James Gibson, director of the uh, Geoscience Research Institute here in Loma Linda. The editor is uh, Clifford Goldstein, and there are a number of other people who have uh, worked on it. Um, we've already been through five lessons, the last one being creation and morality. And uh, now we're going through creation in the fall. And uh, we still have several to go. And the memory text, um, again, I find myself inter uh, being interfered with by the fact that I learned it in the Old King. Um, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy heel, and thou shalt bruise his head. Correction, it's the other way around. He shall crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Um, and uh, the NIV has it a little bit differently. The comic used to play a female character called Geraldine. I believe this is Flip Wilson, if I remember correctly. Um, in one monologue, she was a minister's wife who had come home with an expensive new dress. Her husband, played by the same comedian, got angry. Geraldine then shrieked in response, the devil made me dry the, buy this dress. I didn't want to buy the dress. The devil kept bothering me. And in fact, uh, I think that uh, earlier on, why, uh, there's the little interlude between the woman and the devil as she is gradually told, uh, well, try it on. It won't hurt. You don't have to buy it if you try it kind of thing. Uh, it was supposed to be funny. But in our world, and the evil in it, um, Satan is no laughing matter. For some people, the idea of the devil is an ancient superstition not to be taken seriously. Scripture, however, is unequivocal. Though Satan is a defeated foe, <coughs> He is here on the earth, and he is determined to wreak as much havoc and destruction as possible against God's creation. This week we looked at Satan's original attack and what we can learn from it so that while we are still under his assault, we can claim the victory that's ours in Christ. Read Genesis 3.1. How is Satan in the form of a serpent described, and how is the truth of that description revealed even in that one verse? And, of course, the verse they're referring to is this serpent was more subtle, more clever, more arun, which is interesting because it's almost the same word as aron, which is uh, naked in the verse before, but not quite. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The cunning of the serpent is seen in the way that he introduces his temptation. He does not make a direct attack, but attempts to engage the woman in conversation. Note that the serpent's words include at least two problematic aspects. First, he asks if God really made a particular statement. At the same time, he phrases his question to raise doubt about the generosity of God. In effect, he asks, did God really withhold anything from you? Did he not give you permission to eat from every tree of, in the garden? By intentionally misquoting God's instructions, the serpent entices the woman to correct his statement and successfully draws her into conversation. The serpent's strategy certainly is certainly cunning. Of course, none of that should be surprising. Jesus called the devil a liar and the father of lies. In Revelation 12, 9, the devil deceives the whole world, which means that none of us, even as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, are safe. Satan has obviously not lost none of his cunning or deceptiveness. He still uses a strategy that was successful with Eve. He raises questions about God's word and God's intentions, hoping to raise doubts and draw us into conversation. We must be vigilant in order to resist his devices. And I think there's something to be said about uh, watching out for conversations that are not really conversations. Compare Matthew 4, 3 through 10 with Genesis 3, 1. And the question that's asked is, what similar ploy did Satan try on Jesus and why did it fail? 
And what lessons can we learn from how Jesus responded to the devil's attacks in the wilderness? In what ways does Satan try the same thing with us now? And of course, Genesis 3, uh, pardon me, Matthew 4, 3 through 10 is the story of Jesus' temptations, and it includes all three. But it's interesting, uh, at least in, in particularly in the first temptation, that it was obvious Jesus was hungry, and the devil tried to, t to draw the conclusion that God really didn't care enough about Jesus and that he needed to take care of himself, um, which is very much parallel to God uh, to the accusation that God did not care enough about Eve and that she needed to take care of herself. The woman and the serpent, read Genesis 3, 2 and 3. How did the woman respond to the serpent and what mistakes did she make? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye she touch it, lest he die. Uh, the lesson goes on to say, though Eve clearly knew the command of God, which shows her culpability, she does make a statement that goes beyond what God had said, at least as recorded in the Bible. God had clearly instructed Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree. Nothing was said about not touching it. Because we don't know what prompted her to say that, it's best not to speculate about its origins. There is no question, though, but by thinking that she shouldn't touch the fruit, she would have been less inclined to eat it because she couldn't eat what she couldn't touch. It sounds protective. How often do we face the same thing today? Someone comes with teachings that are in harmony with the scripture on most points, but not all. It's the few points that aren't that can ruin everything else. Even mixed with truth, error, is still error. Um, that's a point I would probably react to just a little bit. It's a little easier to see when it's not your religion. In most Jewish households, there are two sets of dishes. One for meat and one for milk. And in fact, if you want to know the pretty much the dividing line between a conservative Jew and a reformed Jew, it's whether you keep that particular set of rules. What's it for? The Bible in the books of Moses three times says, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. It's talking about something pretty specific. Baby goat boiled in goat's milk. Well, you really shouldn't boil a, a, a calf in cow's milk, right? Um, you shouldn't boil any cow in cow's milk because you never know which cow is the mother. So any kind of meat needs to be kept completely separate from any kind of milk. And you never know if the dishes weren't washed completely cleanly that there might be a little bit of meat on this dish. And then you put milk on it and you're eating meat and milk that have been mixed together. It's the theology. Make sure that nothing happens. Things like that can get distorted give you another example. Malachi 3 says, don't have your, don't bring your lame offerings to the temple. It says, would you give them to your governor? What would he think about that? So, <clears throat> it's good instruction. So the Jews of his day decided that we need to make sure that this doesn't happen. So we'll inspect the offerings. And uh, somebody would come with the best offering they could, but they'd come from Galilee, and it was, you know, 
50 miles away by dirt road and uh, the lamb had gotten lame on the way. Well, you can't offer that. Well, what am I going to do? Well, I'll tell you what. We have over here some certified pure offerings that we can sell you. Um, yeah, but if we do that, maybe it'll get lame on the way to the temple. You never know. Well, we'll do it on temple grounds, but if we do that, we can't use Caesar's money because it has his image on it. So we're going to have special temple money that doesn't have images of Caesar on them. Um, and of course, the people who change your money, they have to make a living too, so you know they get a little cut out of it. And you can see how from the attempt to make a simple prohibition effectual, you can get a whole commerce department going. And of course, there'll be the inevitable abuses. Somebody brings their offering, which is now lame. It is rejected. Um, uh, they trade for it. Then uh, the person who um, traded for it lets it heal for a while and resells it. Well, it's healed now. Except that the first family sees their offering being sold to somebody else for a little more money. And that's why Jesus could legitimately say, get these things out of here. Yes. Um, I just saw a good example of truth is expedient. An article in CNN says that a Catholic hospital has accepted the definition of the state as to the viability of a fetus. The Catholic Church, as you know, believes that a fetus is a, a, a child from conception. But in this case, to win a court case in Colorado, which they did, they said no, a child isn't a, a viable human being until birth, and they won their case. So truth is expedient, and we see it used that way <laughs> most of the time today. Can we do those kinds of things ourselves? Make rules that sound good, that are kind of biblical. You know, they're based on biblical. They even go a little further than biblical, and then we use them in ways that are definitely not Christian. I should also tell you that the bishops are looking at it, giving it great and deep thought. And that's our only hope. Well, I was thinking that another example would be what Muslim women wear. Um, it's designed so that men will not lust after them. So in a way, it kind of keeps them from touching them yes. through their clothes. Yes. Yeah, I'm thinking about an article published by Advin, Advindicate about the building in honor of the notorious abortionist Edward Allred. He's killed thousands and thousands of unborn children. And the building was dedicated in his honor at La Sierra University. Now, what can we say about that? I can say something about it. Being in the fundraising business at the university for 20 some years, Alred's name came up repeatedly because he is a very wealthy man. Every time his name came up, I stood in opposition, saying we should not be taking this kind of money. Go on the internet, see what the world thinks of this man. Why would we pollute our fundraising with his kind of money? Every time I was opposed, money speaks, and it speaks eloquently. My brother is a classmate of the man you're talking about, and he says that 
He's had a change of heart and is wanting to be re- a reconversion experience. And I hope I'm not exaggerating that, but he's had a change of heart. And I think we have to honor that. Every year, the class parties are held at his casino. <laughs> and he is a sponsor of that class party. I'd like to see a little more evidence of conversion. So do we as conservatives sometimes do the same kinds of things? I mean, I remember reading a uh, wonderful uh, uh, little thing that was circulating around that said we we're not going to eat meat. And you get into it and you find out, well, we're not also going to eat ice cream. We're not going to eat ever. It means if you take a slice of birthday cake, you're going to be violating that pledge. Um, is that really what God calls us to? You mentioned earlier the not boiling a kid in its mother's milk. What was the reason for that? We don't really know. I mean, you can speculate that perhaps there was a Canaanite uh, ceremony that was meant to increase fertility or something, where you take a, 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 a kid, a little baby goat, and uh, kill it and then put the pieces into its mother's milk. And, you know, just the thought of how great a sacrifice the mother was making, I don't know. Uh, I mean, people did things like burn their kids to, uh, in the fire, so um, I almost think that some of those religions wound up trying to uh, gross people out, if I can put it that way. Um, but the point is, it's a very specific prohibition. You expand it to everything. Well, I'm not an expert on it, but I have heard that that, that in fact, was a pagan ceremony. Um, and so I, that's why they shouldn't do it. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've heard people say that. I, I haven't seen anybody pull up an ancient source that described it that way. So I don't know for sure. Um, it's certainly a possibility. But I, I think that's... Uh, <coughs> That's an important point. Now, of course, uh, the Sabbath school lesson goes on to quote um, <coughs> Matthew 15, 7 through 9. Well, actually, it doesn't. Uh, it goes on to cite it. And that's the one uh, where, <laughs> interestingly enough, this is Jesus citing Isaiah. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouths, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. I think we have to be really, really careful. I'm not against man-made commandments. I'm not against people having rules of them that they kind of live by. I just think we need to be really careful about investing them with divine authority. Well, I think we should be careful about pointing the fingers at other people and the things that they're doing wrong because didn't Jesus say that the worst sin is um, pride? I'm sorry, didn't Jesus say the worst sin is pride? So, I mean, we can sit here and pat ourselves on the back for not doing things you know, that other people are doing or whatever, but I mean, I think we need to be careful. <laughs> well, that's that's part of what I was trying to say is that we have to be careful of ourselves more than others. Other people have to live with whatever they've done. We have to live with what we do. And that's one of the reasons why I, I think we need to be extra careful when we start talking about these things that we don't limit it to just somebody else. And um, the other two texts that are uh, cited there, Revelation 22:18, of course, talks about adding to the book, um, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these word things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And uh, in Colossians 2, uh, 20 through 23, 
Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, the storkeia to cosmo, um, <clears throat> why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are perishing, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things indeed have a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. It's a difficult passage to translate, but the point seems to be that it looks good, but it doesn't really do anything. The problem of sin is not a lack of rules. And it's not, I would add, even a lack of obedience to the rules. It's a reprobate heart. Even in secular society, we often hear calls for more laws against crime when there are already sufficient laws in existence. We do not need new laws so much as we need new hearts. And uh, the question uh, is asked, and we've partly dealt with it, uh, in what ways might we, might we be in danger of following the things warned about here? Standards based on biblical principles are crucial. The question is, how can we be sure that the standards and rules we apply aren't going to lead us astray? Something to think about. We'll come back to that at the end if uh, anybody's thought of something in the meantime that's worth discussing. Um, <coughs> The next uh, section is entitled Deceived by the Evidence, and it says read Genesis 3, 4 through 6. And what are the principles that led to Adam's and Eve's downfall? And what can we learn from their experience that can help us to deal with whatever temptations we face as well? And of course, Genesis 4, uh, 3, 4 through 6 said, And the serpent said unto the woman, she, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Satan was successful in drawing Eve into conversation and raising doubts about what God had said and why. Now he tells Eve that God is not telling the truth and provides an explanation for God's motive behind his forbidding them to eat of the fruit. According to Satan, God is withholding something good in order to keep Adam and Eve from reaching their full potential. In doing so, Satan builds on his previous question about whether God has withheld some of the trees from them. Eve uses three lines of evidence that lead her to the conclusion that she would not benefit from eating the fruit. First, she sees that the tree is good for food. Perhaps she has observed the serpent eating the fruit. You may have commented on how good it tasted. It's interesting that though Adam and Eve were told not to eat of it, she notices that it is good for food. Talk about a conflict of, between the senses and a clear thus saith the Lord. Is there really a conflict between the senses and a, and a clear thus saith the Lord here? Is it necessarily true that everything that tastes good is good for you? No. <laughs> now we've learned that the hard way. And Eve apparently hadn't learned that. But it's certainly a logical possibility, even if you haven't learned it. What I think the devil did was actually got Eve to be selectively hyperskeptical. As long as everybody's on the up and up, you can believe everything you hear. Once you have somebody saying somebody else is a liar, you immediately have to ask, and how do they know? And are they the ones that are doing the lying? In other words, you can't just go and be skeptical of one side without using an equal amount of skepticism against the other side. And I think that's part of what we've gotten here, is that Satan succeeded in getting her to be skeptical of God without being skeptical of him. A second line of evidence that convinces Eve to eat the fruit is that it is pleasant to the eye. No doubt all of the fruit in the garden is beautiful, but for some reason Eve is especially attracted to the fruit that Satan is offering her. 
The supposed power of the fruit to make one wise is the third reason that Eve wants to eat from the fruit. The serpent assured her that eating the fruit would expand her knowledge and make her like God. Of course, the sad irony here is that according to the Bible, she already is like God. Well, there's one piece of bitterness that God has to live with that she hadn't tasted yet. And she had no idea how bad it was. We are told that Eve was deceived, but Adam was not. If Adam was not deceived, why did he eat? Adam consciously disobeyed God, choosing to, choosing to follow Eve rather than God. How often is the same kind of behavior seen today? How easily we can be tempted by what others say and do, regardless of how contrary their words are and actions are to the word of God. Adam listened to Eve instead of to God, and the rest is a nightmare known as human history. But in the middle of this, there is grace and judgment, and there are two days spent on that. In Genesis 3, after the fall, the Lord's opening words are questions. Where are you? Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? What is this you have done? In contrast, God's first declarative, declarative statement, like he did in Genesis 1, his first statement of fact follows these questions. And what does he say? He says it to the serpent. And uh, the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you, thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and thou shalt bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Our memory verse for this Sabbath. Thinking through the implications of what is happening here, God's first declarative statement to the fallen world is, in fact, a condemnation of Satan, not humanity. Indeed, even in that condemnation of Satan, God gives humanity the hope and promise of the gospel. In verse 15, as he declares Satan's doom, he pronounces humanity's hope. Despite their sin, the Lord immediately reveals to Adam and Eve the promise of redemption. Notice, too, that only after this promise, only after hope of grace and salvation is given in verse 15, also known as the first gospel promise, does the Lord pronounce judgment on Adam and Eve. And then he said to the woman, I will greatly multiply your sorrow. And to Adam he said, because you've heeded the voice of your wife, cursed is the ground, and so forth. Don't miss this point. The promise of salvation comes first, followed by judgment. Only against the backdrop of the gospel, then, does judgment come. Otherwise, judgment would mean nothing but condemnation. But scripture is clear. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Why is it so important always to dwell on the fact that God's purpose is to save us, not to condemn us? How does sin in our life cause us to lose sight of that crucial truth? That is, how does sin cause us to turn away from God? Yes. Who is Satan's seed? I'm sorry? Who is Satan's seed? It's actually Satan himself, isn't it? Well, there must be some more than that. I, 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 we're going to have enmity between us. Well, you know, the interesting thing is, if you, let's go back to that verse again. Um, there we are. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Her seed shall bruise thy head, not thy seed's head. And thou shalt bruise his heel. I, I'd have to go back. I bet you that's a he in Hebrew. Uh, it's masculine. It's translated here so that the seed and it correspond. 
but in fact in Hebrew the seed would be a, a male masculine gender so that uh, the use of the he would be perfectly legitimate in this setting. I just happened to look at that with my Bible and it, the he, the other he is an it too in my Jerusalem Bible. Instead of it? Instead of, no, the it, the he is an it, so both of them are it's. So well, both of them are it. Well, it has he in both places. I think it's, it actually can go either way um, because uh, Hebrew doesn't have a neuter. Um, but the point of it is that the seed agrees in that the seed is definitely masculine uh, or definitely not feminine, let's put it that way. Um, and so the contest is actually going to be between the devil and the seed. Or at least between the serpent and the seed. Isn't the seed of the, the woman stand Jesus? In for the devil. Isn't the seed of the woman Jesus? Yes. Then who is the seed of the devil? Is it my brother sitting here beside me? Is it? Yeah, it's, it's who. It's, he, it's, it's a masculine, uh, what we would translate he normally. You know what? Um, Jesus called the Jews. He said, your father, the devil. So there you go. They were the devil's seed, for one thing. Although, again, you want to be careful about generalizing to all Jews from that. Well, do you know what the Hebrew says for thy seed? Is, it, is that what it actually says, the Hebrew? Thy seed? Zerag ha and zerag ah. It's, it's, it's your seed, um, you singular, zirag ka. Does, does seed really have to mean a blood relationship? Or could it be a kind? Like we were talking about a couple of weeks ago that, that animals of their kind. Well, if you, if you use the Apostle Paul in, the, um, in your theology, he talks about if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So one could argue that it's those who decide to be on the side that Abraham was on who are truly his seed. Um, certainly John the Baptist understood that, you know, don't say we're children of Abraham because God is able to raise out, up sto out of stones the children of Abraham if he needs to. Paul, uh, let's remember that at one time, just shortly after, Jesus uh, recognized that Peter had spoken something directly conveyed from heaven. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, doesn't that mean that I could be, at some point in time, whenever I defend error, Satan's seed. In other words, if we are tool of the devil at some point, if we forget momentarily that we need to be guided by heaven and speak something contrary to the word of God, don't we become perhaps for a second or a minute or a day Satan's seed? Um. If that's the case, the good news is that we don't have to stay that way.
thinking through the implication of what is happening here. God's first de declarative statement to the fallen world is, in fact, a condemnation of Satan, not humanity. Indeed, even in the condemnation of Satan. I think we read this. Oh, that's right, because we went back several. Um, Grace and Judgment in Eden, Part 2. Genesis 1 and 2, God utters imperative statements such as, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven. Let the earth bring forth living creatures. It is not good for man to be alone. All these declarations deal with creation and with establishing humanity in that creation. As we saw yesterday, the next declarative statement recorded in the Bible occurs in Genesis 3, 14 through 15, in which the Lord offers humanity the gospel. Creation, gospel, and judgment appear not only in the earlier pages of the Bible, but in the latter as well. Read Revelation 14, 6 through 7. I think most of you are familiar with that. It was a memory verse a week or two back. In what ways are these verses linked to the first three chapters of Genesis? That is, uh, what parallel ideas are found in all these verses? Remember the angel flying in the middle of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach, and then saying, Fear God, for, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him who created. So you have, you have a, several, at least three, clear links between that passage and uh, Genesis. In Genesis 14, 6, and 7, we see a declaration of God as creator, a key theme in the opening pages of Genesis. In Revelation 14, however, the everlasting gospel comes first, and then is followed by the announcement of judgment, as in Genesis 3. Judgment is there, but not before the gospel. Thus, the foundation of our present truth message has to be grace, the good news that, though we deserve condemnation, we can stand pardoned, purified, and justified through Jesus. Without the gospel, our destiny would be the same as the serpents and his seed, not the destiny of the woman and her seed. And fascinatingly enough, this great news appears even in Eden, in God's first word to a fallen world. And then uh, Friday, it, uh, there's some Ellen White quotes that it gives, and then we're going to have four questions, one of which we've kind of covered. Um, although we'll come, we can come back to it. Um, God gave our first parents the food he designed that the races should eat. It was contrary to his plan to have the life of any creature taken. There was to be no death in Eden. Satan represents God's law of love as a law of selfishness. He declares that it is impossible for us to obey its precepts. The fall of our first parents, with all the woe that has resulted, he charges upon the Creator leading men to look upon God as the author of sin and suffering and death. Jesus was to unveil this deception. And then, but man, man was not abandoned to the results of the evil he had chosen. In the sentence pronounced upon Satan was given an intimation of redemption. The sentence spoken in the hearing of our first parents was to them a promise. Before they th heard of the thorn and the thistle, of the toil and sorrow that must be their portion, or of the dust to which they must return. They listened to words that could not fail of giving them hope. All that had been lost through yielding to Satan could be regained through Christ. And it's interesting that uh, Eve has her first male child and names him uh, Cain, or Cain, because I have gotten me a man with the help of the Lord. Hopefully this is the promised seed to which they look forward to. Kind of sad it wasn't, but um, it g does give you the idea of how much hope they had at the beginning. It seems ironic that, to so many pe that so many people deny the existence of a personal devil while at the same time interest in the occult and satanic wor worship seemed to be increasing dramatically. I'm now taking small quotes and in one case I think a summary out of uh, the book Origins by uh, uh, James Gibson, which is meant as a companion to the, uh, to the Sabbath school lesson. And this is one thing that uh, wasn't really in the Sabbath school lesson itself. Uh, it talks about the problem with the serpent being more crafty. We don't usually think of the 
serpent is being particularly smart. Um, perhaps it's because it can't manipulate anything. Um, birds can take their beaks and do all kinds of wonderful things to get out of cages and um, snakes don't have quite as much room to show their intelligence. Questioning whether God has really spoken has led many to ruin. It can be a legitimate question. Jesus strongly warned us about false prophets and false Christs. And it is important to know what God hasn't said as well as what he has said. However, both the devil and Eve knew what God had said. So Satan's question wasn't sincere. And I think that, that one of the things that's really important if we're discussing with somebody else is if you have somebody who's not really being sincere, you're almost carrying on a show discussion and uh, you're going to have to be careful about taking anything they have to say. You know, it's like a used car salesman tells me the sky is blue, I step outside for a look. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we are dependent on God for everything. Yes, we have a comment here. In question with... Uh, sincerity and so on in our judgment of others. Uh, I've been thinking a little bit about uh, the experience I had when I was a graduate student and so on and uh, how skeptics are there and uh, other scientists uh, over the world where I've done research with them. Uh, they have in a ways uh, a case when they start saying, well, don't tell me the snake can talk. You get into that story and you, you say, that's obviously an allegory. That's not a statement of fact. Snakes don't talk. And um, I've been thinking, well, uh, they, they have a legitimate point there. Uh, to me, of course, the, the best answer that I can think of for that is, Okay, well, if you're going to exclude that story and exclude God out of the picture as science does at present in its, its secular stance, uh, your science is going to tell me there is a God, there is a designer, and uh, unless you can answer that question like, uh, why are the forces of physics so precise? Why is life so complex? Uh, unless you can answer those questions, uh, I feel justified in saying, hey, that there is a reality beyond the simple cause and effect of science. There are miracles, and your science forces me to believe it in that. And once you open that door, uh, you can't say that God could not make a Satan, uh, snake that uh, could talk. Well, more importantly, how do we know that the snake talked of its own free will? You, you of course, you, you know, you, you go too far in this and you've lost uh, rationality, you've lost empiricism, and uh, you're, so, so it, it's a balance. Yes? Yeah, I was going to say, we can go too far with a lot of this stuff. The donkey talked, if you remember that. Puppets talk today all the time. So, you know, people are trying to say something and cast contempt on it, and they know better. Oh, you know, well, when the donkey this, talked, was that really the donkey that well, was talking? Well, was it really the snake that was talking? You know, it's the same, it's the same situation. Yeah. It looked like it. It's a phenomenological explanation. But it's, um, I think it's, it's a mistake to try to... Uh, to try to, to say that, uh, well, snakes don't talk now, so therefore that snake didn't talk, so therefore this is all a bunch of hooey. There was, a, there was a statement earlier on the lesson that talks about evidence and coming to wrong conclusions based on evidence. And we kind of, I don't know, maybe we zoomed by a little too quick, but did Eve have evidence, quotation marks, evidence, 
that what the serpent was telling her was the truth? And how does that apply to us today? Well, I think it's, a, it's an excellent point. Is that in fact, Eve didn't have evidence that uh, the fruit wasn't deadly. You can have delayed effects. Um, he that's was obviously touching the fruit. I don't know where she got that. Don't touch the fruit or you'll die. But apparently the serpent was touching the fruit. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a little bit cautious about drawing too many conclusions from that because you'll read later about, about um, the story about Joseph and his brothers and when he comes in and he says, you're spies, you're spies. And so, no, we're all the sons of one man and uh, we have a brother and he is not. And then later on, the, the dad says, well, why'd you tell him about your brother? And he says, well, he asked us, do you have a brother? You know? So the first story is kind of a, if I can put it that way, a compressed story that gives the major outlines. But it's not a verbatim account because if it had been, you would have that other. And so I think we have to be careful here. Maybe God did say don't touch the fruit. Uh, unless we have a witness there that says, and I heard what God said exactly, and this is what he said, uh, I'm a little bit cautious about saying that Eve was wrong about what she said. Uh, you know, I, I realize that that's, um, that that's um, not the position of the Sabbath School Quarterly, but I think you have to take it, you do have to take it with just a little grain of salt. Uh, there, and then, uh, can you pass the mic up to... The... Um serpent said that this fruit will make you wise and there in front of Eve is a serpent who's talking to her. I don't think any other creature in the world was talking to her. So there's another piece of quotation marks evidence, quotation marks, that maybe the fruit did have some special powers and things. It seems like Without the background of there's a controversy going on, there was some, albeit weak, evidence that maybe um, could persuade Eve one way or another. But if she was aware of this background of this great controversy, then that would have put it all in perspective, I think. I, I think that's a really important point, is that that's why I say you have to be careful of hyper, uh, selective hyperskepticism. That is to say, be skeptical of God, but don't be skeptical of anybody who's telling you that God doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe it would make you wise and then you die. Uh, is the wisdom one which we really want? And, and I, and you know, I've seen this ha kind of thing happen uh, in another setting, and that is in rules of how you look at scripture. And the theological bias is always put at the very end. And yet, we can demonstrate in a couple of uh, cases, the theological bias has in fact changed our, the scriptures that we have. And in some cases, in a bad way. Um, and w once theology gets into it, then it can overwhelm all of those other reasons. And that's bad because then it's having the right theology becomes critically important. And see, this, this is what we don't like to do as scientists is to start out by saying that somebody else is just not telling us the truth. But when you have people that are accusing other people of lying, I think that you have to raise questions on both sides as to who's lying. And you can't go by, well, this person is obviously telling the truth because we just believe him. We want to believe him. What he says fits what we want. Um, at that point, you have to ask equal questions on both sides. Yes? Yeah, science tells us that serpents don't talk, donkeys don't talk, and the dead 
do not come back to life. So what can we conclude for that? I mean, it's like Ariel said, if you don't allow God in the picture, then you get your answers wrong. Yeah. There and then over uh, Leonard. Well, Eve did have evidence as to the kind of God um, that she was with there in the garden. He had made her a perfect person. She had a perfect mate. She was in a perfect garden, beautiful beyond imagination with wonderful food. <laughs> I mean, a wonderful life. So, I mean, all the evidence she'd had up to that point was that God really had her best interest in mind and, you know, I think that he could be trusted. And I think that's an important point. What's happening is not just skepticism, it's selective hyper-skepticism. You're skeptical of what God says unless you can prove it, and you believe the devil unless you can prove otherwise. And that's just not the way we should be operating. We, we may not answer all these questions about just what happened there, but it seems like uh, what's important about the fall is it's critical for understanding the evolution creation issues. Um, you know, science will reject the idea of a personal God and a personal fall, and, and yet criticize Christians, criticize God for all the evil in the world. But yet this, this is the critical factor to explain evil. God didn't make evil. Uh, it came from our fall. And that's hard for many people in science to swallow, but yet it's a critical issue. I, I would agree with that. One of the other quotes that um, he talks about is, we're dependent on God for everything, which is not really brought out in the lesson itself, although we'll have another whole lesson on that. And Eve listened when the serpent contradicted God, and I think that's what we've been talking about, is it's not just a matter of uh, uh, the serpent, uh, I mean, when, when, whenever you raise a question as to somebody else isn't telling the truth, and I think that it's justified for people to ask if you're telling the truth. I guess it's kind of back a little bit, but you were saying something about the story about Joseph. The only other thing I would comment on that is how do we know that in that instance, I think it was Judah that said that, that he wasn't lying because we already have evidence in scripture that he had lied in the past. So is it truly that the story wasn't completely told or is it that somebody might have been, again, lying like we've been talking about? Um, I think that the story is told in a, in a, in a slightly abbreviated way um, at, at the first. And I can visualize uh, Joseph just boring down on them. How come there are only 10? How come you don't have, you know, because he knew Benjamin should have been there with them. And that raises a real big question in his mind. What's going on here? But, you know, uh, the Bible is not necessarily a journal of everything that was said at any given time. If um, Eve had not eaten of the uh, fruit, was the devil still evil? Was the devil still evil? Yeah, in other words, if Eve had never tasted the fruit, is the devil still evil? Well, if I understand is the great it? controversy correctly, that question was settled a long time ago uh, in heaven when the devil first had his uh, whispering campaign and then open rebellion. And it became evident uh, that something weird was going on. And just how bad it was was not totally clear, but, uh, but, that, uh, but that there was something going on that, uh, as I understand it, the devil lost his chance to repent in heaven. Um, 
at least that's a picture that, uh, that we get, the usual picture from the great controversy. Um, and so I think the devil is still evil. It's just that his evil wasn't cooperated on if that, were, if that had been the case. Yeah, I would like to expand just a little bit that when Satan was cast out of heaven, his purpose was to call, cause Adam and Eve to fall. Whether they did or not had nothing to do with his character. They fell, but his character was already evil. That was his intent. So whatever happened to Adam and Eve, that was Satan's intent to begin with, which was evil. Okay, here and then there. Do you, do you think, you know, I'm listening to all this, and I wonder if we're talking about a conflict between lies and ignorance. Whereas, you look at the tree of life, it's the tree of good. You look at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it's the knowledge of good and evil. So when people were talking about Eve knowing that God had taken care of her and gave her all this nice stuff, she only knew the good. But she was very ignorant of the evil. And uh, it looks like God was just telling her, don't go to the other side, even though you don't know it, because it's bad. But um, I don't know. What do you think? Does it, does, is there a difference between ignorance and evil as far as being bad? I, I'm thinking about President Bush. He gets blamed for Iraq, that he was really lying to the, American people that um, that he didn't really know what was really going on there. But in fact, he could have been ignorant about the whole thing, and the only way to find out was to go in there, you know. So, so there's kind of a mix-up between what's a lie and what is really ignorant. Well, I agree with you. I think that, uh, I think that it's a big mistake for us to to attribute to malice what really should be attributed to ignorance. Yes. Um, oh, wait a minute. Um, well, I was actually waved a long time ago. <laughs> you just ignoring this side. Anyway, um, I was just thinking of trying to picture Eve and the snake. Now, we, we don't know a lot of things about this. We don't know really what, what Eve's thoughts were. We don't know really what particularly how the relationship with Adam was. Uh, maybe they had a fight that day. I, you know, you don't know, you know. Um, but also, we don't know how long the serpent, you know, conversed with her. The Bible doesn't say for hours or minutes. It says a, a summary of some things that happened. But I think it, some of the questions here were, well, the the garden was beautiful and, and everything was good. Um, and it seemed like God left them to trust him. He, pr he showed to be trustworthy, I think. But I think per perhaps Eve, in the, the moment and being the serpent, was very good at uh, kind of the manipulation as, as the devil is, you know. Um, maybe she got just caught up in the moment and... Um, you know, emotional thing or something, and the, and then the, the the thoughts and the knowledge of God and the trust in God kind of momentarily, it, it could have just momentarily slipped, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, evidently not. She took the bite of that after. Right? Go ahead. Someone reminded me of something the other day that <coughs> apparently Mrs. White makes a comment in, um, I think it's one of the, testimonies or something, but or early writings, I guess, that um, all the other worlds had a <coughs> tree of knowledge of good and evil, and just like us, and we were the only ones that uh, blew it, I guess. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. It kind of puts things in a different perspective, knowing that other people had the same test. Yes. 
The situation that Eve faced was just a small example of the problem in the whole great controversy. It's very hard for God to deal with somebody who's a liar. It takes a long time, a lot of experience to demonstrate that, that's, that he is a liar. And that's what Eve faced. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that she was evil that she fell. She just happened to be the one who, who, you know, who goofed in this whole thing. And God had to face the possibility of that could sometime happen. Um, but the, the, the problem here, of course, is that yeah, Eve goofed, and in a way it might be a small thing, but, it, but it, uh, it was the trigger that turned Satan loose in this world. He could, he could now claim that these people had accepted him as their ruler, and he, he thus had freedom, and that's what we all are, are dealing with now at this point. Not that little, not necessarily primarily this mistake that Eve made, but the fact that Satan could now claim that this was his world. I hope we won't lose sight of the fact. Oh, excuse me. No, uh, go ahead, and then. Uh, oh, I hope we're keeping in mind that, uh, regardless, I mean, there's a lot of interesting kind of uncertain thoughts going on in <laughs> comments. So I just wanted to clarify. You know, Eve had no excuse. She had been forewarned. The angels, and God, him, Christ Himself, had walked with them in the garden, and warned them. Um, to think that God would hold them responsible for something that they were ignorant of, totally ignorant, had no warning, that's, that's not a very good picture of God, to put it mildly. And uh, Ellen White, of course, illuminates uh, the picture, say, telling us that they were thoroughly forewarned. There was no excuse uh, everyone has ignorance to some point. We don't know everything, and we'll never know everything. We, there's a point where we have to, like Danilo was saying last week, we have to trust. She had enough to go on to trust God, and that was the, what was her downfall. Not just believing Satan, per se, but she distrusted God. That that's what did her in. Well, I just want to bring this a little bit to our age. Um, thinking of Eve, thinking of being a woman, and thinking of being enticed by entertainment. Um, to me, Satan was kind of like an entertainment to her. And I think, well, what is my entertainment? Am I enticed to turn on the TV and watch the movie that I know I shouldn't be watching? Do I get pulled into that, or do I turn it off and say, no, I'm going to be God's child. Um, that would be my take on this in, in my own life. The, uh, <clears throat> the book goes on to talk about the lie that disobedience doesn't bring death is still widely taught and believed, um, which is something the lesson doesn't really emphasize although it's not a lesson on the state of the dead. Uh, the temptation that Eve faced didn't rest upon hearsay, but on actual observed physical evidence, but also upon a misrepresentation of what that evidence really meant. You know, nowadays we, we know through sad experience that what tastes good does not necessarily mean it is good. Um, the serpent was cursed more than the rest of the animals, which implies that the curse was broadly applied and not confined to the serpent alone, um, which is an interesting point that I haven't seen made very often, that not only was the serpent cursed, but every, every other animal was cursed too. And then I'm um, bringing back the discussion questions, although this one we've talked about. Glasgow, over your answer to Monday's final question, what, brings rule, what kind of rules did we make that could turn us into the very people Jesus condemned? That's making extra rules that God didn't actually make. At the same time, how can we make commitments that might help us better to follow the principles of truth as revealed in the Bible? And I think that, that the commitments should, should simply have behind them the knowledge that they're not God's commitments, that they're ours, and I think that would help. Um, 
Eve trusted her senses instead of a very clear command from God. Why do we find it so easy to do the same thing? Well, like I say, it's not really trusting your senses. It's also trusting some assumptions that were kind of nice first assumptions. If it looks good, it probably is. But, you know, ones that, ones that we have sadly learned to realize are not necessarily true. Uh, yes? I was just thinking about that uh, second point there. Maxwell, Dr. Maxwell always asks this question, how do you know if somebody gives you a command that it's really from God? And we go around and around on this, over and over again. So in a way, that number two is not really answering that question. Well, yeah, it's, it's a problem. But I think most of us sense that the life of Jesus has certain normative power for us. And although we might question maybe, um, I mean, even people who don't believe in Jesus will say that he was a good man. And you know, the idea of uh, love your neighbor as yourself is one that's in every religion I know of, not just Christianity. Um, it's perhaps not in quite the clear form that Christianity puts it in. Um, sometimes it's stated as a negative, what you don't want somebody else to do to you, don't do to them. Um, but... Um, uh, there are people who would claim that's what Judaism has to say, but you know, Judaism also has the Leviticus, uh, uh, is it 1918, love your neighbor as yourself? Mm -hmm. So, it was, it's, it's in Judaism too. Um, and uh, some religions will exempt certain people from being human. I think that's a mistake. Uh, and I think that's what the Good Samaritan was all about. Here's somebody who was not Jewish even, who showed that he had the law of God in his heart, the law of love. So, I think Eve trusted her senses in a very particular, sold kind of way. You know, look at it, it tastes good, how can it be so bad? doesn't logically follow. And if Eve had warning that this guy could be a liar, then her not putting up her antenna and saying, how do I know what he's saying about God is really true? I think is a, uh, it would be a major mistake. Um, question, Thing, uh, comment three, I guess, really, in his questions. Uh, dwell on the obvious contrast between the creation story and the various evolutionary ideas that depict natural evil as being part of God's original creative process. Why is it impossible to harmonize such conflicting views of our origins without ultimately destroying the plain meaning of the Bible? How do you get a fall without a good creation? It's tough. There are people who try. C.S. Lewis probably made the best try I've seen, and even he couched it with maybe this is what happened, not with uh, this is what definitely happened. And interestingly enough, when C.S. Lewis tells his own creation story, which is the story that's told in the Chronicles of Narnia, the magician's nephew, it's creation, it is not evolution. It's just fascinating. You know where his heart was, even if his head tried to drag him with the encouragement of the scientific community towards some kind of an evolutionary theory. And why is the correct understanding of creation important in order to gain a correct understanding of the fall? That's an interesting question and it's one that I have not seen anybody give a really coherent answer to who's trying to argue that we need to include some kind of evolutionary story into our, or even a long age story into our uh, uh, 
uh, theology. And then finally, some cultures find the idea of a literal devil nothing but foolishness. Others, in contrast, can be obsessed with the power of evil and evil spirits. And what about your culture? Uh, I think this is interesting because he raises this question uh, in a quarterly that's obviously intended to go worldwide. In some places, they don't question whether there's a devil. They know. Uh, what's the tendency and how can you learn to strike the right balance when dealing with the reality of the supernatural battles in which we find ourselves? And with that, I'll open the floor and, and see how much, uh, uh, how much other uh, comments we get. Uh, yes, uh, Nick. Yeah, I, I'm wondering if uh, everybody has read the latest news about La Sierra and the situation regarding the teaching of evolution as factual, as the real story of what happened. La Sierra has just hired a, an evolutionist to replace some of the other teachers that were let go. I wonder what's going to happen now. Yeah, it will be interesting. And uh, in addition to that, the accreditation, La Sierra has received a s serious warning about allowing outside influence to exert their power uh, in this institution. At the same time, the Adventist accreditation is supposed to come back and see what's taking place. I mean, it's really incredible. Um, and uh, I read that uh, some at La Sierra are preparing to take the steps necessary so that La Sierra will no longer be uh, directly connected with the Adventist Church. Well, um, there's been a, an important correction to that uh, latter comment, and that is that apparently the chairman of the board will no longer be, or they're thinking of changing it to where it will no longer be the automatically the president of the Pacific Union. And the reason given for that is the president of the Pacific Union is also the president of Pacific Union College, and that creates a clear controversy or a clear conflict of interest between uh, the two colleges. And, uh, Adventists have <laughs> had those kinds of conflicts of interest for a long time. I'm not sure why anybody's getting excited about it now, but uh, 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 but the proposal is to let one of the other conference officers be the ex officio chair. And then Ricardo Graham would not be the chair, but you keep all the board members the same. I'm not sure what that changes. So I think we need to be a little bit careful about uh, assuming too much in that particular department. Uh, I am uh, concerned about who they're hiring. Uh, I, I guess I'd like to see more of uh, what the uh, gentleman they are supposed to be hiring uh, has to say about evolution and creation. Um, uh, I tend to be a little bit cautious about drawing conclusions about somebody's beliefs uh, until, until I see what they've actually written or they actually said. So I'd like to have videotape evidence or documentary evidence of what he has to say. Um, I think this is the same kind of skepticism that I'm arguing that you know, whenever you have somebody saying somebody else is a liar or somebody else is not telling the truth or doesn't have the facts straight or has their theology wrong, I think the burden of proof is on the person who makes the cha charge. And I suppose one is, uh, one, it is legitimate, legitimate to be concerned, but I think you have, to, you have to back off and say, and how do they know? I presume that at Vindicate, did the, how do you say, try to document 
what they are publishing, before publishing this, because they are the ones who publish this. And the people that uh, are in charge of authenticate seem to be reliable individuals, to my knowledge. I could be wrong. So. Uh, like I said, I'd like, to, I'd like to see the evidence. It should be enough evidence that it would be obvious to anybody uh, once you've actually <coughs> read it. Oh. Yes. An issue that hasn't come up, and that just to me is very interesting. I don't know how this is going to work out, but we're, we're dealing with a very deep problem here, possibly, and that is, don't churches have a right to run educational institutions? Well, it sounds like WASC doesn't want our, our church to be running. Yeah, well, I, I, I think they're on shaky ground. Of course, this is the stuff that kind of ended up in the Supreme Court. Uh, but... Uh, Traditionally, you know, the Catholics run their churches. Can't Adventists run their churches? Well, I the, mean, the question I, is, can they're, Adventists they're, they're, they're universities. The, the uh, universities, and you know, this is an interesting point because <coughs> it's come up in the uh, in the uh, in other denominations as well. The Lutheran Seminary in uh, I think it was St. Louis. It was uh, Missouri anyway. Um, Lutheran Church Missouri Synod at a Concordia University where they, they had some of the same general kind of problems. Mm -hmm. um, the specifics were a little bit different, but um, they had where they wound up having to mass fire a whole bunch of people who created another university across the street, as I understand it, uh, because they didn't think that they were justly fired. So it, it's, um, it's a problem that comes up all over. Uh, and I guess my, my own perspective is I can live with uh, both kinds as long as people are open and honest about what they're doing. Where I have a problem is when people say that they're good church members and so forth and, and, and they don't believe what the church teaches. Uh, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather them saying that they were members of the church who find certain church doctrines difficult to believe, and then if you send your kids to them, you know what you're getting. Who did the hiring? Pardon who, me. Who hired this person? Was it a board or? Uh, my understanding is the biology department, but I could be wrong on uh, that. And he is an Adventist or no? Uh, that depends on how you define Adventist. Mm. It's mm. not clear. His name is Dr. Diaz, but it states in the article that he is a real hardcore evolutionist. And for somebody to say that and have it published in Advent, Advent I presume they must have done some research. Well, I, I would like to do more than presume. I think they need to state what, what the research is that they're, that mm -hmm. they're basing this on. They really do. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to know if there were other equally qualified candidates, too. I mean, you know, I, that would be of interest to me if, <laughs> if they had to hire him because of his specialty in some field or whatever. But um, I wanted to say somebody told me something interesting about um, what happened to Adam and Eve after the fall by choosing um, the fruit and following the devil. They kind of said to God, we don't want to be dependent on you. We want to do our own thing or whatever. And so after sin entered and the fall, it's interesting that Adam became dependent on where he came from, which was the dust of the ground, right, the, the, the earth. So now he was dependent on the earth for his livelihood. And Eve was made from Adam so she became dependent on Adam. Well, so he had dominion over her. I mean, I just yeah. thought that was kind of, it's true, and I thought that was interesting that they said, we don't want to be dependent on you, God. So they had to become dependent on where they came from. And well, the other thing that's fascinating is that uh, Adam is sometimes depended, uh, depicted as a noble, chivalrous guy who wasn't going to leave his girl in the lurch. And then, of course, as soon as God asked him, well, why did you eat? And he says, well, the woman, <laughs> so much for chivalrous guy. 
uh, it's it's very interesting as to how how uh, <laughs> how love get, kind of gets distorted there. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, well, they eventually blame God. Well, that's, that's the whole point is that, that, and the interesting thing is God said, I'll take it upon myself. You blame me, I'll take the blame. And the, that's what he did. The buck stops there, right? The buck stops here. <coughs> well, we'll see you all next week. <laughs>